Bismillah. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. In alhamdulillah. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'khiruhu. Na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihi allahu falamudilla lah. Wa man yudlil falahadiya lah. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So tonight, inshallah, we're doing two hadiths. Not just one. <laughs> Someone got shocked. Well, two. Okay. It doesn't mean that we're going to stay over, inshallah. But because uh, the two hadiths, inshallah, are similar, close to each other, connected to each other. So it'd be easy, inshallah, to move from one to the other, inshallah, and combine the lessons of each. So we're doing hadith 28 and 29. And you'll see that hadith 29 is very short. Right? It's very short. So, both of these hadiths, subhanAllah, will teach us something similar about what stands between our hearts and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are things that stand between our hearts and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we'll be mainly talking about today, one of the main things that we'll be talking about today, inshaAllah, the barriers. Or what enwraps and covers our hearts. And when the heart is covered, like anything else, right, when it's covered, the outside doesn't have access to it, right? And it does not have access to the outside. So if there is anything that is enwrapping, engulfing, right? Wrapping around our hearts, that thing it will stand between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Stands between us and the truth. So the first hadith here, which is reported by Ahmad and at tirmidhi this is hadith number 28. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن العبد إذا أخطأ خطيئة نكتت في قلبه نكتة سوداء فإذا هو نزع واستغفر وتاب سقل قلبه وإن عاد زيد فيها حتى تعلو قلبه وهو الران الذي ذكر الله كلا بل ران على قلوبهم ما كانوا يكسبون so here he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when one commits a sin, a black spot appears on his heart. When he refrains from it, seeks forgiveness and repents, his heart is polished clean. So I can, I can repeat it again. When one commits a sin, a black spot appears on his heart. When he refrains from it, فَإِنْ هُوَ نَزَعَ This is what نَزَعَيْن وَاسْتَغْفَرَ Asked Allah for forgiveness. وَتَابَ This is tawbah. He repents. سُقِلَ قَلْبُهُ So his heart gets polished, gets cleaned. وَإِنْ عَادَ But if he goes back to it, زِيدَ فِيهَا It increases until it covers his heart. حَتَّى تَعْلُوَ قَلْبَهُ وَهُوَ الرَّانِ And this is the ran. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, no, but on their hearts is the ran which they earned. In Surah al mutaffifin this is ayah number 14. So this, in this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells you something that, you know, we discussed before, which is that when you do something externally, it affects your heart. And of course, vice versa, the state of your heart affects what you're doing on the outside. But here in this hadith, it tells you that if you're doing something wrong, that thing will come back to affect your heart. And if it's a sin, what will it leave? What will it leave? Black, spot. black spot. It will leave a black spot on the heart. Nukitat fihi nuktatun sauda. So you can think, inshallah, you can imagine your heart as being this white cloth. Right? White cloth, white clothing. Right? Or something that is polished and shiny. And you add a white or a black dot to it. That black dot, right, takes away from that beauty and the purity of this clothing. And it takes away from the iman, the purity of iman, the strength of iman. Now, if a person, as the Prophet ﷺ says, if a person, you know, does certain things, that will go away. But if he does not, then there will be consequences. But let's say, stay first here with the fact that when a person does something wrong, it will always, as the Prophet ﷺ says, it will always leave a mark. 
And this mark will be, subhanAllah, in proportion to how big or how small that sin is. So you can think that if that sin is really big, it will leave a really big mark in the heart. And if the sin is smaller, it will be a smaller mark. But nevertheless, no matter what, sometimes, subhanAllah, even when you're not aware, but it's a sin. But you're not aware of it because your heart is used to it. That you don't think of it as a sin anymore, it still leaves a mark. You follow this point? Yeah, it's clear inshallah. So, you don't think of it as a sin, because it's so, so prevalent, and we've been doing it over and over. So, I don't think of it as a sin, it still leaves a mark, it still leaves a trace. And if you want to understand um, the effect of sin on the heart, listen to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ about the black stone, which wasn't black, but became black. So he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is reported by At-Tirmidhi, نَزَلَ الْحَجَرُ الْأَسْوَدُ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ The black stone came down from Jannah. وَهُوَ أَشَدُّ بَيَاضًا مِنَ اللَّبَنِ And it was wider than milk. فَسَوَّدَتْهُ خَطَايَ بَنِي Adam. So the sins of the children of Adam made it black. So you imagine here that this is something that came down from heaven. طيب so like if in, in terms of non-living beings, this is the purest thing that you can imagine, something coming down from heaven. And on this earth, right, it was, it was white. But gradually, with the increased sins of the children of Adam, that turned from white to black, until it was called the black stone. And what this hadith, you know, hints at, is that, you know, first of all, See how sins can affect even non-living objects and things. So if it can affect a stone from Jannah like that, imagine how it affects, you know, the seas, the lands, the plants, the animals, the economy, the crime rate, right? How people like each other or hate each other, harmony, peace, whatever it is. Right? If it can affect non-living beings or things this way, it of course can affect you who is a living being who is more sensitive in much greater ways. Right? So if it can turn a, a, a stone from white to black, it can turn a heart from white and black. And it can turn a society from white to black. In a sense of white being pure and black being impure. But like the extreme of this and that. So if he can do it to a stone, imagine the effect on my and your heart. And what will it do to your and my heart? When a person sins and continues to sin and continues to sin, and he might imagine, well, it has nothing, no effect on my heart. I'm still good, I'm still pious, I'm still Muslim, I still have iman, I still this, all, all, all of these things. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to reveal this heart to you, it may look black, or blackish because why? Because of all the sins that a person is used to, digests, imbibes, practices, and never stops to seek Allah's forgiveness from them. Never stops to say, Ya Allah, forgive me for this. Does not repent from all of them. So one black on top of another black spot, another, another black spot until the heart turns into a complete black. And this is the Ran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in the Quran, which we will, inshaAllah will come to. What does sin do to the heart? And we talked about this before. And this is, I think, in hadith number three. Because this should remind you of hadith number three. We talked about the hadith where the fitna will be presented to the heart. And if you accept it, it will leave a black mark. If you reject it, leave a white mark. If you remember this hadith. What does the sin do to the heart? Right? It will steal away the beauty of your life and the beauty of the heart. The purity of Iman and the purity of your life. The joy of Iman. The joy in your life and its happiness. All that will go away. Because when you think about it in the hereafter, what does sin bring? Next life. Hellfire. But it doesn't only bring hell over there. It brings hell here. And the good deed, what does it bring in the next life? Jannah. But it doesn't only bring Jannah over there, it brings that Jannah here as well. That's in the feeling, in the comfort, in the peace, in the tranquility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give to you, or the lack of all of this with sin. 
So there is hell on earth and there is heaven on earth. So when a person commits a sin, subhanAllah, it will bring to him or to her and will make them live on hell, in hell on this earth. With all of the discomfort, the uptightness, uh, the anger, the anxiety, the fear, the regret, the sorrow. And then the shaitan is after you. The shaitan will not let you have a happy moment. Happy in the haram possibly, but not a real happy moment. And if it's a happy moment, he sets you up. So that you'll be happy now only to be extremely sad later. That's what the shaitan does, which is different than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does with you. Allah wants you to be happy now and later. The shaitan tells you, do this because it will bring you happiness. Just drink. Take that as just an example. Drink. And people think that that will bring them happiness. What happens when, what happens later? What? It's more simple. It's yeah, I mean, all the physical symptoms that will come after, of course, a lot of sin, but all the physical symptoms, the hangover that follows, the vomiting, the incredible, like, incredible headaches, right? And then all the diseases that it puts in the body. So the next day, you're feeling miserable. That thing that was supposed to make you happy and forget the next day, the thing, the cause of your unhappiness is still there. Plus, the headache and the vomiting and feeling lousy and terrible. So this is how the shaitan sets you up. You'll feel better. Just take it. And if you do that, make you miserable later. But what he counts on is that you'll forget. And you're weak. I and you. We'll forget and we're weak. So after a few days what he does, he said, drink later. You've forgotten the lesson. So I'll do it again. Then you fall in that trap again. And then after a few days, drink again, and so on. And you go into this cycle where the shaitan pushes you, you listen to the shaitan, you're more miserable, and now you need more of that disease, because he can't handle your pain anymore. Right? Just like drugs. This is addiction, just like drugs. Right? Just like drugs. So the shaitan says, just take this, and it will make you happy, and it doesn't. So, he steals from this, the comfort that Iman gives you, the beauty of Iman, the beauty in your life. Your life sounds miserable and feels miserable. Your heart feels miserable, you know, and your, uh, your friends, your relatives, your job, yeah, anything that surrounds you loses any meaning because you have covered yourself, subhanAllah, in this sin. So, one other thing also that we talked about that sin does is that it does stand between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, seeing the truth, recognizing the truth, and loving the truth diminishes. Right? Diminishes. It's like a person, right, who can see his eyesight is 20-20. And it, start going, it starts going down. You could see from afar and near. But when your sight starts going downhill, you can't see anymore. And if you can't see, you cannot recognize. And if you cannot recognize, you don't know how to move, where to move and what to do with what you see. Same thing, this sin blocks your vision. Because it stands, if you imagine yourself, there's a highway between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This highway connects with Allah and your heart. Every sin is like a block, is like a roadblock. One roadblock, another roadblock. If there is enough of them, the heart can't see the truth anymore, cannot recognize it. It comes to them, but he can't see it anymore. And even if he sees it, doesn't like it anymore. Because his love is not there. His love is with the dunya. His love is with the shaitan. His love it was with his own desire. But whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him, on the other hand, stop this. No, but Allah, I love it. How am I going to stop it? How am I going to stop drinking and gambling? How am I going to stop looking at what I'm not supposed to look at? How am I going to stop, you know, taking from the haram or giving? The, how am I going to stop? I like it. Right? So the heart's ability, its health to say no, drops because of that sense. Because the heart is infected. The heart is diseased now. So it can't stay, say no anymore. Because I like all of this. So it cannot see the truth. And when it sees it, it doesn't want to follow it. And in the ayah that the Prophet ﷺ quotes in the hadith, The ayah that is before it says, وَإِذَا تُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُنَا قَالُوا أَسَاطِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ When our ayahs are recited and given to them, this is talking about the non-believers. When the ayahs are given to them, an ayah is a sign. 
An ayah is a sign. An ayah is a sign that you cannot miss. A sign that Allah is speaking the truth. This is what an ayah is. Like the mu'jizat of the prophets of Allah alayhi salam ajma'een are called ayat. Why are they called ayat? Because they are signs that prove that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent them, that Allah exists, that Allah is speaking to them. So each ayah is a sign that points to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and proves that what he's saying is true. So when our signs are giving to them the ayat, what do they say? These are the tales of the old folks. All tales, right? Tales of Persia, tales of India, that's what it is. And you're not bringing anything from Allah. This is all human. What does Allah say? Kalla, no. Barrana ala khulubihim makanu yaksibun. No. It is the ran that has covered their hearts that it stopped them from recognizing what the truth is, or admitting to it, or wanting to follow it. It's not what they're saying. They're lying. Tayyib, yani. So you're asking yourself, Tayyib, ya Allah, what is the thing that made them say what they're saying right now? So this is the thing that you have to pay attention to when you're giving da'wah sometimes or talking to someone. Sometimes it's the, the problem is not with the proof itself. The proof is clear. The problem is that the heart sometimes is not ready to accept that proof and to follow it. So you need to work more on that individual and soften their heart and make dua to them and maybe bring different proofs. But the heart is not ready. Otherwise, if the heart is really clean and pure... You know, one proof would be enough for it. One proof would be enough for it, not more. So when, if you were to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ya Allah, what is the thing that stopped them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had told you, Kalla barrani ala qulubihim ma kanu yaksibun. It is this thing that stopped them. The ran that had stopped them from admitting to what the truth is. And one of the shurrah, you know, commentators on the hadith, you know, brought a very nice analogy. I thought it's really beautiful. Um, to understand both the heart and sin. He says, the heart and sins are like your hand. Tayyip, are like your hand. So he says, each sin, right, is like folding one finger. Right? So if you fold enough of them, right, you develop a fist. And the hand now is not open anymore. It's closed. It can't give me anything. I can't take anything in this hand, right? I can't carry anything with it. I can't write anything with it if it stays like this. Like it's the least, you know, Wallahu it's the least useful position that you can take unless you want to what? Fight. Unless you want to fight with someone, right? So again, this is actually the most aggressive stand or form that your hand can take. Which is like sin, by the way, because the more that you acquire of sin, the less of the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you will have in your heart. You'll be more cruel, right? And less merciful, more corrupting on this earth, more harmful to everybody, human and non human alike. So, when corruption, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر, that corruption had spread on land and in the seas, it because of what people had earned. Because of sin. This is what sin brings. Not only brings it on the outside, brings it on the inside. So this is the least useful you know, form that the hand can take. And it happened because of sin. So for you to be able to retain the full function of your hand, where it's open, it can receive stuff, like a heart is able to receive from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to be able to give things like a heart, an open heart can give to other people also as well. What do you have to do? Start unfolding. Right? Removing the sin by one by one, one by one until the hand is open again. And that's the exact metaphor of the heart. When it's closed, it can't take anything. That's sin. When it's open, that's when it's ready to take and to give. So I thought, subhanAllah, this was actually a beautiful one. So we talked about it not recognizing any of the truth. Now, what is this run that the Prophet ﷺ has talked about? This state of run, kalla barrana, rana actually is a verb. Rana ala qulubihim, it overwhelmed their hearts. 
The Prophet ﷺ uses it in the hadith as a noun. But in the ayah, it's a verb. Rana ala qulubihim, their hearts were overwhelmed by the sins that they commit. So one sin after the other, one black dot after the other, until it can reach such a stage where the heart is overwhelmed, hatta, the Prophet ﷺ says, hatta ta'luwa qalba, until it covers his or her heart. When it's like that, that complete, that covering is complete, or almost complete. This is the run. This is the run that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about and His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is talking about. And in the ayah it talks about the kuffar. But any ayah that describes the kuffar or any ayah that describes the people of the book, any Muslim that listens to it shouldn't say, that's not for me. Should never say that is not for me. Why? Because you or anyone else could start as a Muslim. But one sin after the other, subhanAllah, before you know it, you can end up with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. One could end up with Ran and be among the non-believers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had talked about. So there are no assurances and no guarantees. So you, we don't say, oh, this is just for them and we don't have to worry about it. No. You have to worry about it if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that this is one of the greatest blockages that stop you from reaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the run that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about. So it is the sin and sin, they accumulate, multiply, they overwhelm the heart, they cover the heart, the heart surrenders to them. That's it. It's surrounded with blackness, darkness and has no access to the truth anymore, and the truth cannot reach it anymore. After that reaching that stage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks in the Qur'an about um, a possibility of khatm or tab. That's after Arran, one stage after, is the stage of seal, having a seal on the heart. So, like the run, because someone may say, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, um, put a seal on a person's heart? Like the run, what, what, what developed this run, according to the ayah? Why did it happen? Because of sins. So, they committed enough sins, they deserved that state. They brought it on themselves. It's like building a wall. One brick after the other until you can't see what's behind that wall anymore. Exactly like it. So we build it. So once you build it, you have that run. Then if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to see that this person is rebellious and obstinate and does not listen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and continues on his path and there is no good in him or very very little good in him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may decide to put a seal on the person's heart and if there's a seal there's more of a barrier more of a block between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it's not easy to open a heart or a door or a letter that has a seal on it there's more work and effort that is needed and there is a state that follows that, which is the state of qafl, to be locked. And if it is locked, it's like a lock, right? It's like having a lock on it with a key, and you take the key away. If there's a lock on it, that's even a more severe seal on the heart. A more severe barrier between the person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is for the person who had reached the ends, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows Wallahu a'lam, that that person is not coming back. Although some of the ulama said that it's possible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can open that lock on the hearts if He wishes. But it's very difficult to talk to this person or to convince them of anything because there's a lock. And unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to open that lock, give someone the key, and open that lock, you can't go inside. We'll argue with you from now till next year. And nothing will go inside. You can present all the evidence from the Qur'an, from the sunnah, intellectual, uh, emotional evidence, personal, public, whatever it is, nothing will go inside. And that's what a person should be worried about and afraid of. Can I reach such a stage where I will hear the truth and keep listening to it and has no effect on me? No effect on me. Because you may ask yourself, Tayyip, subhanAllah, how do I know that? How do I know? that there's darkness in my heart. I can't see my heart, so how do I know? So, 
Imagine that you're driving your car and there is something wrong with its engine and you can't see the engine you're driving. How do you know if there is something wrong with the engine? You listen to the noise, right? Maybe there's a light that tells you that there's something wrong or you listen to the noise or you witness and assess the performance of the vehicle. You haven't seen the engine, right? So you're driving, you haven't seen the engine. But you decide or you think there's something wrong with the engine. Why do you do this? Because something in the car tells you that its performance reflects something, a mistake or a problem with its engine. That's how you know. You follow me so far? I haven't looked at the engine. I haven't popped the hood and I haven't looked in the engine. I know that there is something wrong. It's the same thing that you would know that there is something wrong, although you cannot detect this blackness in your heart. How do you know? You just see how you are driving, how your life is going. And if you notice that, you're always upset, you're always angry, you're always anxious, you're always dissatisfied, you're not happy, right? Um, when sin happens, it, you're not upset about it. When you lose something that Allah loves, you're not angry because of it. All these are signs on your dashboard that tells you there is something wrong with the heart. The car is not moving right. Your body is not moving right. Your heart is not moving right. All of these are signs. Because if the heart is doing well, you shouldn't have any of this. So it's like a check your engine sign. Oh, why am I so angry? Why am I so irrit irritable? Why am I so um, upset with everybody around me? Why am I so sad? Why am I so depressed? Why do I have so mistrust in my future? Why am I so sad about my past? Etc, etc, etc. When you feel these things, it means that your heart needs attention. So go back to your heart and take care of it. And it may mean that there is enough blackness have accumulated on top of it that it needs a cleanse. It needs to be purified. To go back to its purity and beauty and happiness and joy. Which is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants it. So what does the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say that you should do and I should do? قَالَ فَإِذْ هُوَ نَزَعَ وَاسْتَغْفَرَ وَتَابَ سُقِيلَ قَلْبُهُ So you have an option, you always have an option. Commit something that is haram. You don't surrender to it, you don't say that's it. I'm evil, I'm wicked, that's it. That's, you don't identify yourself with that haram. I'm a thief, right? Or I'm a fornicator, right? Or I am this. And you have the shaitan convince you that you are this person. You never identify with that sin. But you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you from it and that you are distant or distinct from it. So the Prophet says, Fayda huwa naza, he stops and he repents. Astaghfar, astaghfar, asks Allah for forgiveness and he repents. Suqila qalbu, his heart gets polished. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is giving you the treatment in this hadith. What should you do? This is your cleanse. This is the energy, right? Or the, re or the introduction of energy again into your heart. Introduction of Iman again in your heart. How can you climb back up the mountain after I or you have fallen? The Prophet ﷺ tells you, you can come back. And the heart can be polished clean by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only thing that you need to do is three things that he said. You stop. And you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. And you go and repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from what you did. Meaning that you regret what you have done. And at least at this moment, the future is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at least at this moment you say, I'm never going back to this again. And between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm not going back to doing any of this again. Astaghfirullah. That is it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially if you keep asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, Allah takes this sin away. Takes that spot and darkness away from your heart. And you, subhanallah, you'll begin to feel it because you'll feel better. Instead of feeling miserable because of what you have done and guilty because of what you have done and down because of what you have done, when you do this, you'll begin to feel better, closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the energy of iman that had left you comes back to you. And the Prophet ﷺ here is telling us really, and we'll see it in the next hadith, of the importance of tawbah. Right? 
And Tawbah, as you will see from the Prophet Wasallam, just shortly, inshallah, in the next hadith, Tawbah is not something that you're just going to do once in a while. Tawbah is needed all the time. Because Tawbah is a return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're doing sins all the time. Subhanallah. Every day. So we constantly, and Tawbah is a wajib. It's an obligation. That I'm not going to only say it's a daily obligation. For a lot of us, it could be an hourly obligation. Coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking for forgiveness all the time. Tawbah is this, you know, detergent that cleans your heart. That cleans your body, that cleans your mind, that cleans your life. And keeps bringing you back and back and back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The shaitan takes you away, keeps bringing you back. Takes you away, keeps bringing you back. So you're constantly fighting with the shaitan and you're winning because of Tawbah. Because you realize that you have to engage in tawbah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's move now to the next hadith. And in that hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is in hadith now 29, reported by Muslim. He said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّهُ لَا يُغَانُ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِي وَإِنِّي لَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ فِي الْيَوْمِ مِئَةَ مَرَّةً So he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's at times a thin shade that comes upon my heart and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness a hundred times a day. Are you? So he's saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, something about himself. He's sharing with you something about himself. But there's a lot in it, subhanAllah, to learn. He says, Innahu la yughanu ala qalbi. There is this ghayn, I'll explain it, inshaAllah, that, that comes upon my heart. And for that, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me a hundred times a day. So, what this hadith is teaching us, subhanAllah, is the... Um, what distance between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do and does, in fact. What is the Prophet ﷺ saying in this hadith? Or what is ghayn? The heart of the Prophet ﷺ is the most pious heart in, in, in existence. The heart of the Prophet ﷺ is the most sensitive heart to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the closest heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So there is no argument there. But the Prophet ﷺ still said that there is this thing that comes and covers his heart. And that is ghayn. And they explain and they say that ghayn is also similar to ghayn. Ghayn is a cloud, a cloud of the sky. Ghayn is also like a cloud. But the ulama say that Ghayn is the thinnest veil or the thinnest covering possible. A very thin, light covering. So there is Ghayn and there is Ghayn, the cloud, and there is Ran. So the, some of the ulama, like for instance um, Ibn al-Qayyim and Ibn Kathir, they say the Ghayn is for the prophets of Allah or the ones who are very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they experience Ghayn, that very thin, the thinnest of layers. They experience Ghayn. They say those who are pious, the second degree, they experience Ghayn. And if you remember an early hadith, maybe there was hadith number five, or something like that, where we said that the heart of the believer, right? Every heart of the believer will have something like a cloud that will cover it, and it will leave it. If you remember that hadith, right? Like that, the moon, it will have a cloud that will cover its shine, then it will leave. So that's the ghayn. So they, this is for the pious, so that's the second degree. And they say the ran is reserved for the non-believers. So the ghayn, ghayn with a noon, is reserved for the prophets of Allah or the people who are very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where does it come from? You think about it. You say when you, when you are very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you're praying, when you're reading the Quran, making dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the heart is very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's as, as close as your heart can be. And your iman is very high. Am I right? And your heart is very responsive, very sensitive to anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you. This is what we're talking about a stage when your iman is very, very high, at its highest. Now think about it. You're done with your ibadah and you go back home. And you talk to your family and you have to deal with, with some urgent matter. You're dealing with your bank account or whatever. Does your heart stay at the same level? It doesn't stay at the same level. 
Right? So it must go down. Your iman must go down. So the Prophet ﷺ, obviously, right, when he's worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he reaches heights that no one else reaches. And how close he is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then you cannot stay in that position all the time. Even him وسلم, it's not possible for him to stay in that position all the time. He has to step out. Because he's a human. He has wives. He has children, right? He has the community that he has to deal with, problems that he has to deal with. So when you're dealing with all of this, Iman cannot stay at that top level. It must go down. Because of that distance between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you are in salah, there is nothing between you and Him. When you're reading the Qur'an, nothing between you and Him. But now when you're dealing with people, yeah, sometimes there is... That inconvenience, somebody hurts you, somebody says something about you, you get distracted. So all of this, all these are distractions or barriers that can stand between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they will take away, slightly away from our iman. And if you, you might be familiar with one of the sahab of the Prophet wasallam in the famous story, Handala, where Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu met him one day. And he told him, how are you doing? And he said, Handala has committed nifaq, talking about himself. I'm a hypocrite. And he told him, why are you saying this? And Handala was one of the scribes of the Prophet wasallam. And so he's like one of the elite sahaba. So Abu Bakr asked him, why are you saying this? And he told him, he says, when we're with the Prophet wasallam, and he reminds us of the hereafter, we see it, we feel it as if we're seeing it with our naked eyes. It's like, we, I can see the hereafter, I can see Jannah and heaven, you know, Jannah and hell, right there in front of me. But then when we leave, وَعَفَسْنَا الْأَمْوَالَ وَالْأَهْلَ وَالضَّيْعَاتِ When we leave and we are with our families and our money and our businesses, we forget a lot of this thing, you know, that you know, we enjoyed before. I was in the masjid, mashallah, my iman was great, I was in the halaqa, I was in the salah, I was in taraweeh, whatever it is, my iman was great. I left the masjid, went home, a lot of this, you know, iman, a lot of this spiritual charge left me. So he says, you know, to him he said, this is nifaq, this is hypocrisy. So Abu Bakr, you know, radiallahu anhu said, I also experienced the same thing. So let's go and ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about this. So when they went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, again he said, he said, I've committed nifaq. The Prophet asked him why, he repeated the same thing. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, he says, by the one who has my soul in his hand, if you're going to continue in the same state, where you are with me, continue in the same state when you leave me, and to continue to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the same intensity, indeed, the angels of Allah will handshake you on your beds and on the road and in the road. Right? And an hour like this and an hour like that. So imagine, the Prophet ﷺ says, if it is possible for you, which is not possible, if it is possible for you to continue to be at the same level, high level of iman, you'll be able to see the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they'll extend their hands to handshake you. Meaning that you've reached the levels of the angels of Allah. But he's saying, alhamdulillah, no, that is not possible. You have to have an hour like this and an hour like that. Of course, you know, some of the Muslims, right, misunderstand that, right? An hour like this and an hour like that. Especially like olden t- uh, days, I don't know, if still today. An hour like this and an hour like that, meaning an hour in the masjid and an hour where? In the bar, right? Hour like this and an hour like that. It's not like that. He's not talking about this. He's talking about what him said. An hour like this where you are, your, your man is so high and you are with me. And you are in dhikr and talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, etc, etc, etc. And your man is exploding, let's say. And then the other hour is your hour with your family. And the hour in your business, and the hour with your children, and the hour with your friends. Not in haram, but in halal. But your iman cannot always stay at that level. Right? So this is the balance that the Prophet ﷺ taught us and the Islam teaches us. Nevertheless, right, the Prophet ﷺ, right, was at such a high level of iman. That his heart, subhanAllah, could not bear any distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because his heart is so pure, he could notice any, the thinnest of layer coming upon it. The thinnest of layer coming upon it. It's like, again, if you have a very white cloth, 
right? And the, you know, the smallest of contaminations coming on it, you can notice it. The heart of the Prophet ﷺ was so pure and so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and connected to him that when he's out, when he's outside and dealing with people and talking to this person and that person, he could feel the thinnest of layers coming upon the heart. And could heart and his heart, his pure heart could not tolerate distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why he engages in what he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness a hundred times. We'll come back to this, inshaAllah. But this teaches us, this hadith teaches us that the greater the distance between your heart and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more layers will gather around it. And the harder and harder it will get. And the closer it is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more able you are to remove these layers to get a softer heart and to detect whenever there is something wrong that is happening to your heart and to fix it. So if it is close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, constantly remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the heart will be softer. It will have fewer layers around it. And you can fix it easier. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, just again to highlight distance. Right? If you're away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this will happen to you. If you're close to Allah, you'll be saved from it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ وَلَا يَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلُ فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدْ فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ so the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hasn't the time come for the hearts of those who believe to be affected, to be humble, to be affected by Allah's reminders and the revealed truth and not be like those who received the scripture before where a long time has passed on them and so their hearts were hardened and many of them were disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning Allah gave them the truth, gave them the scripture and they neglected it. Did not go back to it, disobeyed Allah in it. And they continued to, this, to do this for a long time. فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدِ A long disconnect between them and what Allah revealed. So what was the result? فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Their hearts hardened. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, again if you want to link it to the stone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, ثُمَّ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ فَهِيَ كَالْحِجَرَةَ أَوْ أَشَدُّ قَسْوَةَ Then your hearts hardened after this, and they became like rocks, like stones, or harder than that. So imagine having a person, a human being, and if you're able to actually extract, metaphorically, but you're able to extract his heart and put it next to a stone, you'll find that the stone will have more mercy in it than that person's heart. So if you're asking yourself today, how can humans do so many crimes against other humans today? Take their lives, take their money, put them in such misery. How could they have the heart to do this? That's how they can have the heart to do this. Because they don't have hearts. They have stones inside. They don't have hearts. But if they feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they were close to Him, they wouldn't be doing these things to them. Because no one who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be able to say or do these things to other human beings. Whether they were Muslim or not. To, uh, to another human being, they will never be able to do this. But see what the distance does. Distance between you and the Qur'an, distance between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala corrupts your heart to the degree that it becomes more useless, right, than a, a stone. And that's why also it's uh, reported in Muslim that Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu, he sent for the Qurra of the Basra. These were the reciters of the Qur'an, of that city, that important city of al-Basra. And so 300 of them came to him, who all of them had learned the Qur'an. And he said, he told them, and this is the advice that he gave them, you are the best among the inhabitants of Basra and the reciters of the Qur'an among them. So continue to recite it. And don't let too long of a time pass without reciting it, or your hearts will harden as the hearts of those before you did. So this is, subhanAllah, this is the advice from a Sahabi of the Prophet ﷺ. He understood this ayah. He gathered the best people of Basra. Right? Like imagine the best people of the city that you're in, collecting all of them. And you're saying to them, as far as I know, you're the best people of this city. You memorize the Qur'an, you know the Qur'an. 
Don't let a long time pass between you and reading this Quran and learning it. A long time passed between you and your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if this happened and you are the best of people, you'll turn into, your hearts will turn into stone. So that's one, th- one of the things, subhanAllah, that we have to be worried about. That your heart can become a stone because you're so far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, going back to the heart of the Prophet sallallahu we said that his heart was so pure he detected that thinnest of layers. You know, others may not be able to detect it, but he وسلم, detected that. And so to remove it, or even to prevent it from coming, the Prophet وسلم, will engage in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continuously, and we will see what he had said. So, Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, I'll, yeah, I'll shortly, inshallah, share that with you. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he sh- shares with us, Barriers that the heart can have that can stand between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He talks about this ghayn and ghaym and ran. But he also says there are also 10 barriers that can stand between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, between your heart and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, denial of Allah and His names and attributes. This is one. Worshipping other than Allah. Bid'ah, uh, uh, creedal innovation. Practical innovation. So creed and belief or creed and practice. Major internal sins, like arrogance, envy, and showing off. He says, this is a barrier that stands between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Major external sins, right? Like external sins that we know, like alcohol and fornication and all of this. And subhanAllah, he put the internal major sins before the major external sins. As the internal major sins are a greater barrier between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the major external sins. And this is a point that we, inshallah, talked about, I think, in the first meeting, in the introduction. And it's really important to notice. Because we are aware of those major sins, the outward ones. This haram and this haram and that haram. But the internal haram is hidden. So maybe you'll find that a lot of us are quick to condemn that external haram, which deserves condemnation. But we don't think that, well, I have arrogance in me, I have pride in me, I have riya in me, which is far more serious than that external sin. Far more serious than that external sin, because it goes untreated, undetected. That external sin, when someone does it, everybody criticizes him. They shun him. He feels, you know, like an outcast. In a society of believers, he feels like an outcast. But when you hide or what you hide on the inside, no one can detect. And it's far more serious. Then number six, he says the barrier is the barrier of minor sins. Then number eight, his excessive indulgence in permissible acts. When you engage in too much indulgent, uh, permissible acts, then they take you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So rather than focus, let's say, on ibadah or coming close to Allah, uh, you'll be just worried about, you know, my car and my house and my possessions and this and that. So the, that is a hijab. That's also a barrier that he talks about. And here really he's ascending into the thinner barriers, right? The ninth barrier, he says, unawareness that we are created to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that He deserves our continuous thanks and remembrance. That no matter what you do, and this is what the Prophet ﷺ is asking forgiveness from. Because you can never thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enough. You can never remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enough. Right? That's why one of the wisdoms, they say, why does a person, when they leave the bathroom, what do you say when you leave the bathroom? When you're done, ghufranak. Why are you asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness? It doesn't say in the hadith, but some of the ulama, you know, extracted that wisdom or, you know, brought that as a wisdom. Why do you say that when you leave the khala? Why do you say ghufranak? No, 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 when you leave. Dhikr, right? That's what it is. Because during this time, I could not remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like admitting, subhanAllah, admitting that you need, or Allah deserves to be thanked all the time. All the time. You know the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who are worshipping Allah all the time. On the day of judgment, what do they say? We did not worship you as you deserve to be worshipped. And they were worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continuously. Not like us, continuously. And then at, the day, at that day, they will admit, they will say, we did not worship you enough. 
So when you leave, subhanAllah, you're saying ghufranak because of this. Because you can never remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enough. And every opportunity, every missed opportunity, is like a time that you need to ask Allah to forgive you because you did not take advantage of it. And the tenth one is that barrier, he said, anything that stands between you and the diligent worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is also another barrier between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um... When your heart is close to Allah, when your heart is really sensitive, we talked about the Prophet ﷺ could detect the thinnest of layers. You'll start to be sensitive to the smallest sins. Even though other people are not sensitive to them, you'll be sensitive to the smallest sins. And Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu, Speaking to the Tabi'een, he says, إِنَّكُمْ Repeated by Al-Bukhari. إِنَّكُمْ لَتَعْمَلُونَ أَعْمَالًا هِيَ أَدَقُّ فِي أَعْيُنِكُمْ مِنَ الشَّعْرِ إِنْ كُنَّ لَنَعُدُّهَا عَلَىٰ أَحْدِ النَّبِيِّ صلى الله عليه وسلم من المبقات. He says, indeed you're committing deeds that are thinner in your eyes than hair. More insignificant in your eyes than hair. But we used to consider them at the time of the Prophet ﷺ to be great destructive sins. And just to show you, right, the levels. Right? So, because at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the Iman was highest and the Taqwa was highest. So these things, they looked at them as, oh, that, that is not something that any of us should do. And if it's done, it's, that's a destructive sin. Whilst time passes, and taqwa declines, he says, now you guys are more used to them. When you do it, you consider it to be something small. But this small thing at that time, is very big. And consider that he was just talking about just one generation. Consider now, what we're doing, compared to what they were doing. But even subhanAllah, in your society, in, in the time that you're living in, the more taqwa that you acquire, the more that you'll be sensitive to sins that before, you thought that there was nothing wrong with them. Right? And maybe think about Ramadan. The more time that you spent in the masjid, you come back to your normal life, and the things that were, you know, usual to you, would seem, subhanAllah, sinful. This is, how could the people say this thing? How could people talk about this thing? How could people look at these things? Though a month before, maybe I and you were looking at them without thinking or a second thought, but because you've distanced yourself from them, acquired more taqwa, when you are away from sin, you became more sensitive to it. So that also one of the lessons of the hadith. So, the Prophet ﷺ was asking Allah for forgiveness. What did he exactly say? In another narration, right, in a different hadith, it tells us. Ibn Umar anhu says, he says, we used to count that the Prophet ﷺ would say in one sitting, yani in one gathering when he's sitting, in one sitting, رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَتُبْ عَلَيَّ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَابُ الرَّحِيمُ مِئَةَ مَرَّةً O oh, Ya Allah, Rabbi ghfir li, Ya Allah, forgive me and accept my repentance. Inna ka anta tawabur rahim. You are the person who accepts repentance. You are the person who accepts repentance and you are the most merciful. So a hundred times that the Prophet ﷺ would say, in one sitting, like let's say for instance, Allah A'lam, half an hour, an hour, that the Prophet ﷺ would say, رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَتُبْ عَلَيَّ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ would say, the only difference would be the end is Al-Ghafoor instead of Al-Rahim. Okay? hundred times before he stands up from that gathering, رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَتُبْ عَلَيَّ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الْغَفُورُ A hundred times. Why would the Prophet ﷺ say this? A, because he wants to remove that layer. How do you remove that layer? What's the cause of this layer? That thin, that ghain, what's the cause? Distance. Distance from, with the Prophet ﷺ is distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So how do you remove it? Bring yourself closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do you bring yourself closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You remember Him. And you remember Him as often as you can. And you remember Him specifically with forgiveness because there, there you're humbling yourself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Saying, Ya Allah, there is nothing that I can do that is enough. 
There is no thanks that I can give you that is enough. There is no remembrance that I can remember you with that is enough. So you Allah, accept, accept this from me. Because you are at tawab rahim and forgive me. And when you do this, that layer starts going away. So the thing inshallah, because I want to stop now inshallah, the thing that we want to learn from this is this supplication, this remembrance from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The more distance you have with Allah from between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the greater and the thicker the layer is between you and Him. You want to remove it, you come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the easiest things that you can do to soften your hearts is to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to repeat as much as you can, at least, at least every day a hundred times, if you don't want to say the whole thing, Rabbi Khfirli, Rabbi Khfirli, Rabbi Khfirli, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Right? With awareness, acknowledging what you're saying, asking Allah for something, expecting something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or you can say the whole thing, Rabbi Khfirli, wa tub alayya inna ka anta tawwab rahim Rabbi Khfirli, wa tub alayya inna ka anta tawwab rahim And you can vary it sometimes, Rabbi Khfirli, wa tub alayya inna ka anta tawwab al-ghafoor, Rabbi Khfirli, wa tub alayya inna ka anta tawwab al-ghafoor. So this is what we have insha'Allah for today. Uh, if there are quick questions, insha'Allah we can take them. Um, or otherwise, insha'Allah we'll adjourn for tonight and meet you next week, insha'Allah. Are there any questions? No. Okay, no promise I'll answer it. Just go ahead, insha'Allah. While eating, ah. Uh-uh. Oh, inshallah, like on the dinner table, right? And uh, it's better that you leave it. It's better that you leave it because what it does is that it stands. It really isolates you from human contact, and especially family contact and family conversation. So what it does is that this technology really is is atomizing or it's separating people into these islands where they don't really have human-to-human contact. They have virtual contact, but not really human-to-human contact. And they're very distant from the closest people to them, family. So you don't know what is going with them. You don't know how to help them. And so you lose all of this. So definitely, I mean, the, the parents should set... Um, some guidelines. So when you come to the dinner table, there are no phones. There are no checking messages, right? There's no internet, none of this. You sit and you talk to each other. And you have eye-to-eye contact and you engage in conversations. And that is what is best. And you have to train your children like that. I mean, and reconsider whether they should have phones for, to begin with or not. And then train them that there should be times before the salah, right? After the salah, when going visiting relatives, where you have to be keep away from your phone. Right? Not be so addicted and dependent on it. So, definitely. Naam, inshallah. So, the dua. Rabbi ghfir li wa tub alayya inna ka anta at-tawwab rahim So you're asking Allah for forgiveness and to accept your tawbah, right? Because He is at-tawwab rahim Rabbi ghfir li wa tub alayya inna ka anta at-tawwab rahim and the other one, you just put al-ghafoor. Rabbi ghfir li wa tub alayya inna ka anta tawwab al-ghafoor. So insha'Allah, your mission for next week, insha'Allah, try to say this a hundred times every day. Because now we've learned it. So try to say this a hundred times every day. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most merciful, in it to bring life and iman to our hearts and to move any barriers between us and Him. Ameen, Ya Rabbi Al-Alam. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.